Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. Finding a job in today's economy is not the easiest thing to do. But before you find a job, you have to learn how to write a resume. And with me is someone who has been called a guru, maven, and whatever else you want to say about how to find a job in the federal government. And I would like to welcome Katherine Troutman tonight. Thank you very much, Barry. I'm very glad to be here and talk about how to write a great resume. Well, thank you. I'm so glad you came up from Baltimore for this. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> how did you get started in learning, or teaching rather, how to write a resume? Well, I started the business a long time ago um, with a partner. Um, the first business was uh, selling ads to a local print shop in Washington, D.C. My partner was a law student at GW, George Washington University, and he said, uh, Kathy, go over there to the print shop and sell them an ad because we get our resumes done over there. All the students do. And I said, what's a resume? I didn't even know at that time. He said, well, that's what we fill out when we go get our, our law jobs after we graduate from law school. So I went to the print shop, and I said to the, uh, to the manager, uh, would you like to run an ad in the directory? And he said, oh, no, we don't uh, put any ads in school directories at all. And I said, well, could I just see a resume, please? Because I'd, I'd like to see what that looks like. And he brought out the resume, and it was real pretty, bold type and italics and, and a picture in the right, and it was ivory paper. And, and I one of my skills is I can type really fast. So I looked at that, and I said, now, how much does it cost for that uh, resume? And he said, well, it's $27.95 for um, 50 copies. Well, I did the math real quick. I knew that I could type one page in around 20 minutes. And I figured out that I could make more money typesetting resumes than I could doing my job, which was retail at that time at you know, a very low hourly rate. And so I went back to my partner, David, and I said, David, I could do that. And that was the beginning of the resume place. Well, how did you know what to put into the resume if you never knew what it was before. Well, in the very beginning, the law students would write their own resumes. They would put down the name of their school and their courses and their activities and internships. I wasn't writing. I was very young, and I just made the resumes pretty and then put the picture in the right, you know, that was when pictures were allowed on resumes. And so we had a great business making resumes look beautiful in the very beginning. So then how did it evolve that you wound up specializing in the federal job market? Well, there was a uh, change. I w I, my office was in Washington, D.C. on K Street. So we were only, you know, four blocks in the White House and, you know, in D.C. And um, at the time, Vice President Gore had a program called Reinvention Government. And he decided that um, the government should change their application form from this form called a 171. And it was long and outrageous looking. It was green and little skinny type. And uh, it was just a, a horrendous form. Sometimes people would have 40 or 70 pages long. And so uh, Mr. Gore said that the government should accept resumes like the rest of the world. And I, I was an expert at 171s, too, because, of course, I was in D.C. So when he said that, I honestly could barely believe it, because at that time, a resume was one page in 1996. Even if your type font was nine point, it was one page. And we were going to go 171 is 40 pages to one page. So I thought someone needs to design a special resume format for government. And that might be me. So <laughs> I went to my friend at OPM, at Office of Personnel Management. I helped him with his job a while ago. And I said to him, uh, his name was Dick Whitford. I said to him, uh, Dick, what is OPM going to do to write a guide for people to write this new resume style for government, which I called the federal resume in the very beginning. And he said, well, we have this little flyer called the OF510, and this is what you would need to follow 
to know what to put in your resume. And I said, well, that's not enough. People need to see samples of what this new resume should look like. And it should be called a federal resume, not just a resume, to be different than the regular resume. And so finally he just said, oh, Catherine, write your book. <laughs> So I wrote the first book on how to write a federal resume. It's called the Federal Resume Guidebook, and now it's in its fifth edition, and it turned out to be a really good idea because the federal resume is very different from that private industry resume, and that's how my whole federal business got started. Now, there's a big difference. Yes. It's like when I was looking through your book, How to Write a Federal R Resume versus yeah. the Corporate, it's like you have to put in certain characteristics, certain things. They were also asking for backup data from your college or wherever you went to school that you need documentation on right. that. But isn't a lot of that illegal of what they're asking? No, not illegal. Uh, they just want more information. You see, the um, federal human resources specialists have to ensure that you are qualified for a job in order to uh, determine that you are best qualified or to get you referred to a supervisor. So on paper, you have to prove that you have the experience for, let's say, a very popular job in government that's popular for private industry to move. It's called the program analyst. Now, that's a job where a person analyzes programs and they study um, events and, and uh, processes and they look at efficiency and effectiveness of processes, and they look at the cost benefits, and they do briefings on what they find, and they do reports, and they um, solve problems and take care of customer services. That's what a program analyst does. And people in private industry don't know how to write that down. They don't know that what they've done is a market analyst or as an account representative or a national account representative, or as a realtor, that they have actually done program analysis work. And what I just did was interpret what a person might do in private sector for federal for that job series. I'm also, I'm spellbound because this it's like even finding out what you do from corporate to corporate. Yeah. How do you translate what you do so that somebody who's going to say, ah, that's the person we want, and actually mm -hmm. it's a whole other vocabulary for the federal government. It is. It, it is a different vocabulary. I was looking at a resume just today for um, a gentleman who's been out of work for a year, and he uh, wants to be an accountant. He, said his, he says his dream job is to be for the federal government, and he's been in the state government in accounting and accounting management. And... It's stunning that he has not had success in writing a federal resume, but it's because he's trying to qualify as accountant and budget manager with one resume. And I looked at the resume, and I didn't see enough budget language to help him to qualify for that series. He, there is an official uh, section in, at the Office of Personnel Management website. It's called the Classification Standards, and it's a write-up for the accounting series, and the budget series, and the auditing series, and they're all different. And he has not been looking at that, just guessing, writing down what he's done in a historical way, which is not the way government wants to see the resume. I could help him. So in other words, you really have to do your homework yeah. to figure out the other language. Absolutely. If you do your homework, like I have written in my books, if you know how to analyze a, a USA Jobs a vacancy announcement and know what job title that you're qualified for, you can master the game. You really can. But if you don't know what you're applying for or what salary is right for you, then it's just a big gambling match that you may not win. Because I know... I'm just going back to all the information that they're requesting. I have two questions here, so yeah. I don't know which one they asked. Because they asked for your Social Security number, yeah, I which I think is really that. I wouldn't want that floating around. That's yeah. number one. And how do you 
understand what the classifications are, G2, G7, GS, what does it all mean? Well, it, it, they're general schedule pay scale. And it's GS 5, 7, 9, 11. So if you are living in New York City and you are earning 79000 that would be around a GS 9. So all you really have to do is go to uh, the OPM website, opm.gov, and or search GS schedules, government jobs. You can do that also. And look at the, the, the GS levels, which start with five and go all the way to the 15. And you can, one way to determine what GS level is right for you is look at your salary. So if you're making 65,000, that could be a GS seven. If you're making 130,000, that might be a GS 13. It's, in, it's on the scale, it's on opm.gov. Look it up. What are some of the common pitfalls that, other than not analyzing what you do and translating it into government speak, mm -hmm. what are some of the pitfalls that people fall into? Well, there's a new pitfall. Um, USA Jobs uh, website has just added a feature where you can upload your resume. You can take your private industry resume and just upload it out of your browser. Well, it doesn't say uh, beware. Your resume should be different than your private industry resume. Some of the people, I'm a federal career coach and I work with people in, basically I'm a turnaround specialist. <laughs> they, they apply for 200 jobs and don't have any success and they might call me. Um, so I look at what the things that they've been doing and they might have uploaded their private industry resume and that resume probably doesn't even have months and years in it, and just maybe the years, and it wouldn't include the supervisor's names or salary. And you know, just by uploading, they have not really applied for any job. Because well, for one thing is very important is the month and year, because all of the requirements in USA Jobs say that you must have one year specialized experience. So you need to have your months and years. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, it's just a simple problem, but very, very dangerous. Well, if you've been in the workforce for a long time, many times the person that you worked for might not even be alive, let alone how do you find them? Well, you, it's, you, you may not be able to. A lot of people cannot put their most recent supervisor because people change and companies go out of business. Uh, but if you can put in just a couple of references, that will do it. But if, you, if people would use the builder instead of uploading a resume, that will prompt them to put in the right information, the cities and states and supervisors and phone numbers and salaries. And HR loves their details. <laughs> they really want this information. They want compliant people who give them the information they want. So simply, I recommend use the builder. Yes, it will take you one hour to copy and paste your resume into the builder. But if it helps you to land one of the best jobs in America, I think it's a good idea. Just time well spent. Time well spent. How do you look how do you look for a job? in the federal government. Let's say you've done something, you've been unemployed, you don't know what you want to do. How do you translate your job skills to a future job that you don't even know you're capable of doing? Well, the first thing you can do is, is just go to usajobs.gov and go to the top screen and type in, uh, let's say, New York City. Okay. Just look at every job in New York City. You could do that. And there's probably uh, 2,500 jobs or maybe 1,200 jobs in New York City right now. And you would see all these jobs right here. Then you would have to break it down in salary. So you would, uh, let's say you're making 80,000 now. So you'd want to see every job in New York City at 80,000. There's probably only 400. So you could scroll through them and look at them. And so if you're in accounting, you're definitely not going to look at computer science or biologist or administrative. You're going to be looking for jobs that have a title similar to what you do. So that's what I recommend people do. Believe it or not, uh, it's hard to search job titles if you don't know the federal job titles, but you can simply start by searching geographically. Well, I, my office is in Baltimore, Maryland, and when I consult with people, my first search is every job in Baltimore. <laughs> at a certain salary. So I'll say, all right, they want to make 65000 or forty-five or whatever the number is. Every job in Baltimore, 45000 
I look at them all. You know, and then, then I decide I can take out the ones that I'm not interested in. Now, there's a criteria in USA Jobs. You can apply two ways. One is all U.S. citizens, which is me. I'm just a U.S. citizen. Or there's people who are status. And the status people are current federal employees, past federal employees, military personnel, and uh, people with uh, disabilities, and a couple other special, like Peace Corps, returning Peace Corps people for one year, and some spouses. So I personally have nothing special about me. I am only a U.S. citizen. So I would always search for U.S. citizen. So it's the government breaks it down to yes. all these different categories. Right. So it's either U.S. citizen or status. So just make sure you're, if you are just a U.S. citizen with nothing uh, and no preference programs for you, just make sure you check off. There's two, two uh, radio dials. Check off U.S. citizen. Is there a program that you can upload your skills and that it would match all the government skills? Doing it the other way? No. No, that's a good one. I'll tell OPM about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. How do you recommend people stand out from the crowd when they're applying for a very popular type of a job? That's a great question. Um, I recommend that people include a very good accomplishment or a story on page one of their resume, preferably the top half of page one of their resume so that uh, there's something, there's a grabber mm -hmm. in the very beginning of the resume. So if there is an example that you have that will demonstrate how good you are as a budget analyst or logistics specialist or an administrative assistant, um, if you can add an example right at the very beginning of the resume, uh, that, that would be great to add there. Um, we worked with a, a, a young woman who is a, a social worker, and she was uh, from San Antonio, Texas, and she wanted us to help her to move into a v Veterans Administration MSW job. Well, I asked her, "Did you work? have you worked at all with veterans? Well, probably she had. So um, she said, yes, there is a particular story. And she worked with a, a veteran who was living in his car with three kids. And he came to her homeless um, MSW program. And she uh, worked with him to help him get out of the car and to help the kids stay in their schools help the kids to get transportation to the homeless shelter where they were going to stay in the very beginning. She helped them get a home. And we put that story at the very top of the resume, right after the dates and after the job title. And um, she did get hired in the VA uh, as a GS-11 uh, social worker, working with a very special program there in San Antonio for the veterans. And we just updated the resume for her to get a promotion. It's been one year, and she's going to get promoted already. We hope. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic story. Yeah. So the story went right at the very beginning. But uh, if you have an example that demonstrates that you're really good at what you do, it can really help you to get best qualified and to get referred to a supervisor. It can also help that supervisor want to meet you, want to call you up and talk to you to see how, uh, how good you would be on their team. So that's, that's my best tip. Do people kind of, since the, if you're going from corporate to government and you don't always know the game plan, is it quite possible that you underqualify yourself and you should be higher than where you are? And, it, and if so, do they automatically move you up to a higher grade or something? It can be either way, Barry. Um, people can write their resume at a level they're uh, too high. They could be trying to apply for a GS-13 when they should apply for an 11, or they could be applying too low. Uh, it just depends on how the resume is written. So, uh, no, the HR, per well, if they're applying for a job that's, a, let's say, a 9, 11, 12, those are called career ladders, and you'll see in the announcements that they're offering this job as a 9, 11, and 12. And if you apply for the 9, no, actually, you have to apply for the 9, 11, 12. If you only apply for the 9, you're not going to get hired as 11, 12. They're not even going to offer it to you. You must apply. And if you apply to 9, 11, 12, then they're going to choose what level is right for you. So the answer is really yes, but you must apply to the positions. Some of the jobs have no uh, opportunity for that. Sometimes they're just like a 12, 12. 
there's no promotion potential. It's always great to look for the ones that have a potential for, for getting a promotion. The government jobs with promotion potential is fantastic. It's, it, there's nothing like it in private industry. Where do you find that there's a void of people applying for jobs in the government? There's a, there's a void uh, for new graduates. The new graduates are really struggling to break into government because many of them only have their education to qualify them for positions. And right now, with so many people out of work that are very well qualified and have even 10 years of experience, they, um, they beat out the new graduates. So the new graduates struggle to, to get qualified. Now, if I answer it differently in terms of what job series or what position is uh, not receiving enough applicants? Yes. That's a hard one because I think uh, they're overwhelmed with applications. <laughs> Anywhere from 300 to 1,000 applications for, well, let's say if you're looking for a job, if they're looking to hire in um, Pierre, South Dakota or Alaska, or um, some small town where no one wants to live, then they're struggling to recruit. That's what I recommend to people. If you really want to get a good federal job, find a town where no one wants to go and apply for a job there. And maybe you can get hired to get in the door. But if you're applying in Washington, D.C. or San Diego, or big cities, Norfolk, Tampa, Oh my gosh, there's so many people that are looking for jobs in New York City. But you have to what you have to do is still apply. You know, the odds are higher than they used to be because of the unemployment rate. Let's go back to somebody who's just graduated. Okay. Who wants to get in the door. Is there anything that they can do or better yet should be doing while they're in college? so that they can stand out when they apply for a job? Absolutely, while they're in school would be the best. Uh, there are programs, uh, internships that they can apply to, uh, student career experience program, the SCEP program, um, which may get eliminated one of these days, but at the moment is still out there, and they could go to their career center at their university and ask them if they have any internship programs through government where they have an agreement for positions, or, if they can't find leads in their career center, they need to think about who they know that works in the government or who their parents know who works in the government and uh, find out where they work and talk to them and send them their resume. The very best way for a student to find out about internships is through networking. That is the best way. And just network, network your, your neighborhood, your your church, your synagogue, anyone who knows anyone and what you do, if you find someone who works in the government, even if they're three people apart from you, you say, what agency do you work in? And do you have any student internships there? And who would I send my resume to for consideration of a student internship? And the students need to be really... Um, Aggressive. Aggressive is the word. <laughs> that is, I've been, I'm working on an update of my book, My Student's Federal Career Guide, and we have seven case studies now in the book. Oh my gosh, every one of them got their internship from networking. Well, it goes back to when you're in the corporate world. It's networking, networking, networking. Yeah. Now, with social media, Mm -hmm. How do you find that differentiates going into federal? Does it help you to go into federal if you put your not a whole resume or partial resume up on the the net. Put your resume. LinkedIn is very good. It's very popular among the feds now. Put your resume into LinkedIn and make sure you join and then you can join a couple of government organizations and follow the agency that you might like to work. If uh, if you knew that you wanted to work for the General Services Administration, which is, you know, the number one real estate <laughs> uh, agency in the government, you could look for all the people in LinkedIn that work for GSA get their names in LinkedIn, get connected with them, follow them, find out where they work, what city and state they're in, what division of real estate they're in, and start writing. Only contact those or accept LinkedIn from people you know. So well, I guess the, let's say the student writes their resume that they want to work at NASA, that their degree is in um, 
space or biology or whatever major it might be, and they put in their resume that their career objective is to work in NASA uh, and to uh, to study space exploration. So if they have that in their resume and they are in LinkedIn and they write that they would like to be connected with a professional at NASA, and okay, this uh, space person at NASA, this professional engineer, will look at this young person's resume before they accept their connection and say, oh, I see they're at University of Virginia and they had a, a, a special project in uh, space exploration. Sure, I think I would like to have them connect with me. You have to show a connection. With the veterans returning, how can we help them get acclimated and do a resume or get back into society? Well, there are, there are many resources for the veterans. Uh, when they first come out, they're in a program called the Transition Assistance Program. So, um, but the Guard, not necessarily, but the, the services, active duty services, make sure you go to your TAP class. Um, many of the military services teach a program that I created called 10 Steps to a Federal Job that I'm really proud of. And um, it's taught at about 80 military bases around the world. So that feature is federal. Other things that they can do is research um, federal resume writing on the web. Find out what you can find. Um, I offer my book, my military book, Military to Federal Career Guide, for free as an ebook. If you just write to me and ask for it. And um, my book has samples of resumes. and. The big thing to know for veterans is, again, the federal resume is not the same as the private industry resume. It's more detailed and more focused. So just learn the differences between the resumes. And then apply for jobs and be persevering. Maybe apply for three jobs a week. Just keep it on your list of things to do and um, get help if you can find it. I provide a lot of services on my website for free, uh, a federal resume builder, a cover letter builder, I've got webinars for free, and then of course services as well, but I do what I can. After you've submitted your resume, mm -hmm. then what? Well, in my 10 steps, that's step number nine. It's called track and follow up. <laughs> and USC Jobs uh, gives you the ability to track and follow up on your applications. And they uh, mostly do submit results in the um, USA Jobs. So make sure you check the results. Find out if you were uh, not minimally qualified or qualified or best qualified or referred. Make sure you look up your results. And then if you are a veteran uh, or a disabled veteran, you can call and ask for your results and uh, probably get some very good response. Anyone can call and try to get response. The way to call HR is early in the morning or the afternoon, but honestly, you honestly don't really even have to call anymore. You can check what happened. Hopefully, uh, you are best qualified. If you're not best qualified, you're not ever going to get referred. So if you see and you're applying for job after job after job and you are not minimally qualified, fix the resume right away. Don't wait for 200 applications and say, I've been applying for a year. I'm never minimally qualified. That means something's wrong with the resume. And you can see that online. You think it's necessary to include a cover letter? Well, it is optional now. With the hiring reform by President Obama, he did say in the, in the reform that you can submit a cover letter and you can upload it in USA Jobs and all the websites. Many of the vacancy announcements never mention cover letter, but you can submit it. I'm a big believer in the cover letter. Uh, now, the human resources person may not read that letter. Uh, they might just read the resume. But if you are referred to the supervisor and they have 30 or 40 resumes to read and you've written a good cover letter that describes why you would be the best candidate, it's very possible that that resume, that cover letter could help you to stand out. I have a free cover letter builder on my website that I created in 1996 and it's like, it only has like 12 fields and it's an awesome cover letter builder and it's free on my website. Wow. Just fill in the blanks and hit send. And it's a, a, a fantastic little letter. It just says, I would be an asset to your organization because, one, two, three, four. I can offer you the following things, one, two, three, four. It's a great cover letter. 
So I, lo I like cover letters a lot. You don't have to do it. It's not mandatory. I just think if you have the ability to say what you can offer, that you have that one-year specialized experience, why not? Is there anything special about the government interview you should be aware of? Yes, there is. The government interview is an examination. It's not just a little talk. Uh, when you go into the interview, on average, um, they're 45 minutes to an hour. However, the other day I heard about one that was three hours. And it's called a behavior-based interview, and that's step 10 of my 10 steps. Now, what they're going to do is they're going to figure out seven to ten questions to ask every candidate and they're going to score you as you answer the questions so the questions come right from the job announcement and so you have to prepare your answers before you go into the interview so you could get a score of zero through five on the in on the questions and if you don't have an answer for any of the questions that will give you a zero so you have to prepare for interviews ahead and um, get ready <laughs> because it's an examination it's it is totally scored and you go out of there with a score of you know 50 or 100 and yeah I do interview prep with people and it's quite challenging just prepare prepare practice role play with someone listen to yourself talk about these questions and try to get uh, gear up with your examples oh big tip read the mission and memorize it that's probably one of the questions Read the, read the mission and memorize it. Yeah, for the, uh, for the agency where you're going, look up the website, read the mission so that you know it or print it out and take it to the interview with you. Because if you don't know the mission, you're probably not going to get hired. So have it. Be ready to talk about it. And good luck. In the closing moments of the show, what would you like to leave the audience with? Okay, I'd like them to explore usajobs.gov. Look for the positions in your city and just be curious about those positions. Also, find out and look for books at your library or online and Amazon and find the differences between a federal resume and a private industry resume. It's critical that the resume be different and longer and more detailed. And uh, think about accomplishments so that your resume will stand out and uh, be determined. And networking is, is just critical. So those would be my main things. Well, Catherine, it's been wonderful. You've written so many books. I can't believe all these are just on the federal government, and we've got to talk about some of some more of these. And your place is called Resume Place? The Resume Place, Inc., yes. And the web, website is resume-place.com. Thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, you can get hold of Catherine or myself here at the Women's Connection or you can contact Catherine directly through resume-place.com. Look forward to hearing from you. Bye now.